Hey, Ant110L. All right, I wanted to make um, an announcement in a couple of videos about what the last couple of weeks are going to look like here. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, obviously, COVID and the ensuing uh, doing lessons from home kind of thing really sort of screwed up our plans for the lab. It's hard to do a hands-on lab when you're when you're working at home. Um, so obviously having to put together a presentation would be a little bit tricky, especially because this was supposed to be for group work. So first I want to talk about how I'm revising the, uh, the grading for this class. So first of all, um, you see here on the screen that <clears throat> the labs are worth 10 points each. Um, you know, the ones that you like, even if we do two chapters at a time, whatever you turn in is worth 10 points total, right? So there were nine of those over the course of the semester, and I'm going to drop your lowest lab grade, right? So that leaves eight. So that's 80 points total. So that remains the same. The attendance uh, was going to be two points each time you showed up to lab. Um, and, uh, and because you're allowed to miss up to two technically, um, you know, that was going to come out to 20 points. Well, since we're doing this from home, as long as you turned in a lab, you're getting the attendance points for that. So I anticipate everybody's going to get 20 points for attendance. Um, so that doesn't really change. The Quizams, um, we were going to have a second one around the time that the whole COVID thing really started to get serious. Um, so we haven't had the other two. So, so really, we only had one of those. Um, and then the presentation's not going to be happening, right? So whereas it was going to be 200 points total, now uh, we already took one Quizam. We're not going to take any more, so that's 20 points. Um, and what I'm going to talk about in, in this video and, and another one, I'm, I think I'm going to break this up into two, is this final activity that I want you to do uh, to reinforce some of the concepts in population genetics. So this activity is going to be worth 30 points. So the total, the new total is going to be 150 points. Um, most people have the vast majority of points for the labs, attendance, and quizams. Um, definitely labs and attendance. So um, I don't necessarily anticipate that there's going to be a great need for extra credit. However, if there is... I will revisit that after you've turned in this population genetics activity. Okay, um, before I talk about the activity, which I'll do in the next video, um, I thought it would be useful for you to have a review about the forces of evolution, especially because uh, it's been a while since we talked about it in the lab, and some of you were not in my class, uh, lecture class, so I don't know exactly what you talked about or what you didn't. Uh, when it comes to the forces of evolution. So I'm going to try to do a fairly quick review. Um, first, we know that in a population, if you know the percents of the genotypes, so remember the genotypes are like uh, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. Okay, so if we know the frequencies of those in a population, generally speaking, if there's no evolution, if no forces of evolution are acting, those frequencies don't change. Okay, so just because one allele might be dominant over the other, that doesn't make it better. Um, and that doesn't mean that it spreads in frequency or anything like that. Um, so after one generation of random mating, all these, these frequencies remain the same, unless there's evolution going on. Okay. So a force of evolution is something that can change the frequencies of genotypes and therefore alleles in a population, okay? So uh, there's four such forces, okay? Um, recombination is not one of them. You don't have to worry about that. The four forces of evolution are natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow. And so I'm going to go over those real fairly quickly in the following slides. But first of all, natural selection is the one that most people think of when they think of 
evolution in general, but it's not the only force of evolution. Um, so, you know, it was, it was Charles Darwin that came up with the, what became the theory of um, adaptation by natural selection. And he, he ended up calling it natural selection because, you know, people were already familiar with the idea of uh, selective breeding uh, of plants, of animals, right? And so that's, and that's why I have this picture of all these dogs, right? All of these things came from wolves, right? They, they all share a common ancestor in a wolf, and yet you can go from a chihuahua to an Irish wolfhound. You can get dogs who are, you know, lap dogs, dogs who are hunting dogs, dogs uh, that are herding dogs, dogs that are protective in nature. So people selectively bred animals together to get the traits that they wanted, right? Um, and so that's that's kind of where, where this idea came from. In in nature, when when people are not intentionally selectively breeding these things, uh, natural variance in in a trait in a population uh, might be beneficial uh, to the survival and reproduction of the individuals that have those traits. Therefore, on average, they reproduce more than individuals that don't have those alleles, right? So over time, over generations, that allele spreads and the proportion of the population that's carrying that beneficial allele becomes greater and greater, okay? However, there are some uh, things that are important factors um, for natural selection. So it, it, it is a certainty. So natural selection will be occurring if you have the following conditions. Um, a struggle for survival, which really just means competition, competition for resources. Resources are finite in any environment. And, you know, according to theory anyway, um, a species will tend to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce until it gets close to the carrying capacity of that environment and that's when you see really a lot of that competition because you're you're right there at the limit of what the environment can support and so uh, you are competing for resources so those that are better uh, able to secure those resources will do well will survive will reproduce and those who aren't so great at getting those resources uh, will reproduce less or will uh, not survive as long, right? You also need a variation in traits. So I'm going to go back real quick to this last slide. So to get all these different dogs, imagine uh, you have a population of 100 wolves, and they're all the exact same size, and they're all the exact same color, and they all have the exact same temperament, uh, so how are, how are you ever going to get a chihuahua out of that? How are you ever going to get an Irish wolfhound out of that? Uh, the only way that you can selectively breed something is if there's variation in it to begin with, right? Now, that's not saying there were wolves as tiny as chihuahuas or as large as Irish wolfhounds, but there there are wolves that are a little bit bigger, wolves that are a little bit smaller, wolves that are a little bit more um, adventurous or a little bit less afraid of people or a little bit less aggressive. And so you're, you're, you're selecting the traits that are closest to what you're looking for, right? So if you breed, you know, if in each generation you take the two smallest animals and you breed those together, um, you would imagine that over generations, over generations, you're going to get smaller uh, smaller animals, right? Um, but there has to be a variation to begin with. Otherwise, there's nothing to select from, okay? So uh, having a variation in the population is really important. In order for natural selection to work, that variation has to be heritable, meaning that the individuals who have the desired trait can pass that trait on to their offspring, right? So. Uh, that's sort of self-explanatory. And differential reproduction simply means that if some traits are more beneficial than others, 
they will allow on average individuals with those traits to reproduce more either because they live longer or because they're better at mating whatever that means or uh, more of their offspring live to reproductive age um, so they will reproduce more than those who don't have those desired traits okay um, now I'm not going to go into this but in class you know I talked about the peppered moth in um, in Great Britain uh, it was a cookies and cream colored type moth that blended in with the bark on trees very well before the Industrial Revolution and there was some variation in color um, a really small percent of the population uh, was darker colors but they stood out on the trees uh, pretty easily so they they would have been picked off and eaten by birds and whatnot um, because they weren't camouflaged however in the middle of the Industrial Revolution there was a lot of pollution the bark on the trees started to become darker and those darker moths actually had an advantage so the environment changed and now the dark variant is actually advantageous in that environment so you know whereas you had a high population of the cookies and cream one and a really low uh, proportion of the dark ones over time as the color of the bark started changing because of pollution you would see a, a sort of like a flip in the frequency of them right um, I want to go over real quick about fitness first of all Darwin never used that phrase survival of the fittest that was something that his contemporary Herbert Spencer who wasn't really a scientist he was a philosopher and a political theorist he came up with this idea not the idea but the, the, the phrase and he applied it more to social Darwinism so really survival of the fittest is not the greatest way to put um, natural selection um, so just strike that out of your mind um, because fitness doesn't mean you know necessarily being the strongest or necessarily being the fastest it, it it depends completely on the environment okay and remember there needs to be variation in a population in order for natural selection to happen right so if all individuals were equally strong and equally fast you couldn't have selection anyway um, what it means what fitness means in evolutionary theory is relative reproductive success so um, if an individual has a trait that gives a slight advantage in reproduction either because there's a longer reproductive lifespan or uh, more of the offspring live to reproductive age or um, you know it could be something even that has to do with let's just say I'm just randomly like sperm quality or something like that right that the, um, that gives a slight edge in reproduction uh, for any reason uh, over time that will spread in the environment so but it's always relative there's no absolute maximum fitness of all time um, it's always relative to something else okay all right so that's natural selection the second force of evolution is mutation pretty simple um, mutation is how you get variation to begin with so um, mutation essentially occurs either because your DNA is copied incorrectly during normal cellular processes where cells are dividing and reproducing um, or it could be in uh, through some kind of trauma to the to the cells like through through UV radiation um, anything that can damage your DNA could cause a mutation mutations aren't always bad mutations are sometimes good a lot of times mutations don't really affect your fitness at all but um, they can change the frequency of alleles in a population right because they create new alleles for for one okay so that's mutation I'll just we don't need to know about all these different types for this exercise now genetic drift genetic drift I think is extremely interesting but it's also kind of complicated um, genetic drift is essentially random changes in allele frequency it's not changes because one trait is better or one trait is worse it's changes that are random 
So in small populations, you can get random changes in allele frequency. Let me give you a few examples of that, and I'll come back to this slide. You all might remember the Punnett square, how you calculate predicted genotype frequencies in the next generation. Right, so here we've got two peas that are phenotypically yellow. Um, they are heterozygous, meaning they have one dominant, which is yellow, the big C, and one recessive, which is green, the little c, right? So the dominant will mask the recessive in this case, right? So you can only pass on one of your variants, you know, either in this case, either the big C or the little c, right? So that's what we have written across the top and the side of the Punnett square. And that just allows us to calculate the probability of different combinations. So one possibility is that you get homozygous dominant. Uh, you could also get heterozygous. Actually, there's two different ways you could get heterozygous. And then you could get homozygous recessive. So 75% of those will appear yellow and 25% will appear green. But what this really means is in the next generation, if these two peas breed, for each offspring that they have, there's a 75% chance that it's going to be yellow peas and a 25% chance that it's going to be green peas. Now, it doesn't have to, let's say, let's say th these two pea plants, they have four little child pea plants, okay? It doesn't have to match this exactly. This is, this is, this is a probability, right? Um, you can think of it in terms of eye color, you know, uh, and I, I gave this example in, uh, in our class. I think um, at least two of my grandparents had blue eyes. So that means that uh, my parents probably carried the allele for blue eyes. Now, they had four boys. Um, there was a good likelihood that at least one of us would have blue eyes. But guess what? None of us do. So uh, that happens, right? You could get four yellow peas if, if these two pea plants had four offspring you could get four yellow pea plants you could get two yellow and two green you could get three green pea plants it would be rare but you could get four green pea plants right these are all possibilities um, some of them are more likely than others the thing is if you have a huge population these these fluctuations of probability, they will balance out and you will, you will get, if you average out the entire population, you will see that 75% of the time you get yellow pea plants and 25% of the time you get green pea plants approximately. Okay. Um, another way to look at this uh, that I showed in the lecture class has to do with um, flipping a coin. Right, so let's take this quarter. You know, we all know that. Okay, in theory, uh, there's a 50% chance that I'll get heads on a flip, and a 50% chance I'll get tails on a flip. Right, but if I flip it four times, I might get four heads. You know, I should get two and two according to probability, but I could get four, and nobody's going to accuse me of cheating. Now, if I flip it a thousand times and I get a thousand heads, then people are going to be pretty pissed off, right? Um, that's because in small sample sizes, you can get large deviations from expected frequency. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip this a few times. So here's one. Oh shoot, that was tails. Two, tails. Okay. Whoop. Three. Tails, oh my gosh. Four heads. Okay, so look. I'm going to put heads down here. Flip four. I got heads. All right. Five. What do I got? Heads. All right. Six. Tails. Sorry. Seven tails, eight heads. I'll put my heads up there. 
Okay, I got tails again. Tails again. Oh shoot, that's what nine, ten. Heads. So eleven is heads. All right. Tails. Heads. Thirteen is heads. Okay. Fourteen is heads. Oh, look at that. See, I got two in a row. Oh, 15 is heads. I got three in a row. 16 is heads. Tails, 17. Tails, 18. Tails, 19. Tails, 20. All right, so you see how if you, if you look at this graph, um, I started out way far from this 50%. 50% is what I is my expectation value, right? And then, you know, as as the number of trials increased, I'm getting closer. I'm approaching uh, this uh, this ex expectation value, right? Um, and I start to deviate a little bit. But if I flip that like 200 times, it'll it'll really start just bouncing around 50%, right? So, um, so that, that's, that's part of the mechanism behind genetic drift. If you have really small populations, um, and just by happenstance, um, that blue eyed allele doesn't get passed on when it could, right? Um, well then, then that generation can't pass it on either, right? So you, it could drop out of the population very easily. It could also rise in frequency randomly. Um, and, and linger around there for quite a while, okay? So uh, let's just go back to this here. Okay. Um, I also did a thing in class where I, where I uh, had a bag of M&Ms and I counted out the colors and I looked at the frequency of each color and then I had students take small, small samples just randomly out of the bag. And, you know, here's the, the parent population here are the sample populations, and you see like yellow uh, in the parent population is 17%, but in the samples, which are smaller, um, the frequency varies from 11% to 16%. Um, for the blue, 15% was in the parent population, but it varies in the samples from 7 to 20. So you can get, you know, depending on how large your sample size is, you can get pretty large deviations uh, from, from the ex expected frequency. So, um, genetic, so genetic drift can be just because of those types of random effects, and it can also be from sampling. So let's say you have a parent population, uh, like, like the population of France, and a small group from France goes to some other place, let's say Canada, and founds a colony there. Okay. Now, you're, it's like putting your hand in a bag of M&Ms and just grabbing a few out. You're not going to get the equal representation of all the colors as they are, right? So uh, in, this, in this example with these like ladybugs here, you, know, you see a lot of different kinds of ladybugs. But if you happen to get a random sample of a few of them where you've only got really like two or three varieties, then the descendant of the, that population is going to look a lot different than the, than the parent population, right? You don't see any of the gray ladybugs in this descendant population. If you take another sample, you might not get any of the solid black ones, and then in your descendant population, it's going to look different than the sample population. That's called founder effect, and it's a type of genetic drift as well, okay? Um, so gene flow is the fourth uh, force of evolution and gene flow is simply the transfer of alleles between populations right so you may have these two populations of deer um, that are separated by a mountain range and you know maybe the um, kind of average genetic background of these populations is different but then you start to get some gene flow between them um, and that kind of changes up the distribution of alleles in that population right um, so these are all things that can increase or decrease, change the frequency of alleles in a population. One other thing that's important to mention is that 
all of these things can be happening at the same time. And uh, I'm choosing to just talk about selection versus drift because this happens a lot and it's very, very interesting where selection is most efficient and effective when population sizes are large. Why? Well, one, one main reason is because selection thrives on variation, right? If you have a small population, you're not going to have very much variation. So, um, you know, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like, I don't know if you ever played this ethical game of this, this qua ethical quandary type game where, uh, oh, it's the, uh, the world's going to end and we can only choose 10 people to go found a colony on Mars or whatever, you know, well, you better choose those 10 wisely because, because that's the sum total of all knowledge that you're going to have or all abilities that you're going to have on, on that next planet. Right? So, if you if you choose all um, programmers, computer programmers, but no engineers or no mechanics or no um, teachers or no musicians, I mean, you're not going to have a very functioning society, right? But if you choose, you know, all artists, it, you have a similar problem, right? You need a balance of things. Um, so, so variation is important because if you have a problem, uh, but you don't have the right tool or the right variation to solve that problem, your SOL, so to speak. Um, okay. The, um, so, so selection is effective when population sizes are large because of that. And also because drift is stronger when populations are small. But the strength of selection also depends on the selection pressure, which means how, um, if, if a trait affects fitness, how much does it affect fitness? How much of an advantage does it give or how much of a disadvantage does it give to individuals that have that trait? Are individuals with that trait on average having five more kids than individuals without it? That would be a huge uh, fitness advantage. Um, so selection pressure is a combination of what's the environmental condition that is causing like additional competition or, or that's a limiting factor here and how, how much does a trait give you an advantage or a disadvantage in that environment, right? And sometimes the environment changes and so the trait that is you know, more um, advantageous in that situation also changes. Um, I'm just going to skip that one. Uh, so drift is most powerful in small populations because those random effects, like flipping a coin, have a have a larger effect in smaller sample sizes. Okay, so there's a balancing act between selection and drift. Okay, so in the that's it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to tell you about this assignment a bit, show you how to do it, um, and kind of show you examples of, of these forces in a, in a graphical sense, okay? So um, make sure you watch the next video, and I'll see you then.